morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to some of you because you're joining from, from uh, all around the globe. So I'm very happy to facilitate this exchange among experts on this issue of uh, gender inclusive competition policy. We all know that uh, the fight for gender equality is one of the defining challenge of our age. And uh, as we have documented in OECD report three years ago in two, uh, 2017, the pursuit of gender equality is still pretty much an uphill battle. And uh, we, we see in some broad numbers, for example, that women make up half obviously of the world's population, but they still generate only 37% of the global GDP, for example. And uh, we, we see also these days, uh, it's difficult to escape this very clear fact that uh, the women are also at the core of the fight against the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, we can definitely see that the current crisis is uh, aggravating the gender gap, making it even more difficult for women or for women-run businesses to catch up and to fill the gap. Uh, we see, for example, in the healthcare sector where women make up almost 70% of the workforce, for example, they are still very much underrepresented uh, in leadership and also in all the decision-making processes. And it's quite striking in today's uh, discussion. We also see women in the workforce, both whether they, they, they work full-time or part-time, they are clearly adversely impacted by the economic fallout of the health crisis. And because they represent a majority of workers in the most exposed sectors, be it air, travel, tourism, uh, retail activities, or even like food and beverages. So, Today's workshop is part of the OECD's broader effort to take a gender sensitive lens to our work in general, and by doing so to promote better policies for better lives. And it's also, uh, today's event, it's also the first event to kickstart the annual OECD March on Gender campaign. And this campaign focuses on women's empowerment as a key element of an inclusive recovery from the COVID crisis. <clears throat> What we can say is that competition policy is largely gender blind and the relationship between gender and competition policy has to date largely be unexplored. <clears throat> but two years ago in uh, 2018, we began to work to explore whether a gender lens might in fact help deliver more effective competition policy and whether in turn, also a more effective competition policy could help address gender inequality. So really exploring the two uh, directions. And uh, there followed a number of blogs by some of my colleagues, papers, discussions at, uh, for example, the OECD Global Forum on Competition, also the, this event last year, the OECD uh, March on Gender, at the OECD UNCTAD UNESCO Forum also, as well as work by some competition agencies, some uh, private law firms, and uh, bar associations, there has been also uh, academic conferences, etc. So today's agenda will highlight some of the quick questions that are discussed in all these conferences and papers, etc. And let me just uh, mention three of them that are of uh, special interest. For example, are less diverse boards more likely to discourage whistleblowing and also facilitate cartel and collusive behaviors? That's quite an important question. Also, might applying a gender lens to competition investigations lead to the identification of more gender targeted markets with perhaps higher prices and fewer competitors? Or can prioritization of decisions by the competition agencies and also the legal framework in which they operate help competition policy to play a role in supporting the growth of more inclusive markets in general? All these questions are quite interesting and we'll delve into them uh, today's, in, the, in today's workshop. And the momentum behind these discussions has led to the decision to launch with very much appreciated support from the Canadian government to launch the OECD Gender Inclusive Competition Policy Project. <clears throat> this project is a two-year project and the, the objective is to develop practical guidance on how to build a gender inclusive competition policy. And to develop this guidance, we needed, as we do in general at the OECD, we needed to further develop the evidence and also 
strengthen our understanding of the role that gender might play in competition policy. And to do so, uh, the first phase of the project indeed uh, was the launch in, in July last year of a call for research proposals that would help us in developing that evidence. <clears throat> And, and actually, we were very surprised. We, we got a hugely impressive response to that call for proposals. And today, we are very keen to hear from the seven selected research projects. So without further ado, I will uh, pass the floor to my colleague, Chris Pike, uh, who is an expert in the OECD competition division. And he will introduce today's workshop. Chris, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mathilde, for those words. It's useful to put it in the context of all the all the different work that we're doing here at OECD. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'd like to say uh, a big thank you to all of you who are joining us today for this workshop, um, particularly for your incredibly enthusiastic support for this project. Um, and in particular, I wanted to underline, as Mathilde said, just how impressed we were by the number of proposals we received, but also the quality of the proposals and the diversity of them in terms of the countries that they came from, the professional backgrounds of the people involved. Um, we, were, we were really, really impressed. Now, I should emphasize that uh, today's projects are all works in progress. Uh, and so we hope that today's workshop is a really timely opportunity to discuss and provide feedback that can still shape the research that you'll hear about today. Um, but as Mathilde says, the focus today is to develop the evidence and develop our understanding of the role that gender plays in competition policy. Uh, and to that end, as we say, we're gonna focus on four different areas that Estefania and I pointed to in our, in our 2018 paper. Um, later this afternoon, we'll hear about the research that's being done on the use of a gender lens to improve market definition both through consumer surveys and within other types of analysis. Then we'll hear about the way that agencies prioritize their work and the extent to which that reflects concerns over inclusivity uh, and what steps might be taken to ensure that it does a better job of that in the future. And then finally, I know that many of us are interested in how we might deliver a, a perhaps a, also a more racially inclusive competition policy. And that's something that the, the acting chair of the FTC has recently highlighted as an ambition. And so in the final session, I'm glad to say that we'll discuss the South African experience with using a public interest test to deliver a, a racially inclusive uh, competition policy. And we'll be hearing about what the lessons there might be for building a more gender inclusive policy. Um, however, first we're going to focus on cartels and whistleblowing. Uh, and so in a moment, I'll hand, hand over to Isolde Luckenhausen, uh, uh, who's going to chair this session. However, before I do, um, uh, let me just say that we, we want this to be a really interactive session. Uh, as I say, we, we, we think this can really shape some of the research that's going on. And so I'd really encourage you to post questions in the chat as they arise or to raise your hand using the Zoom function so that we can come to you when the, when the Q&A discussion kicks off. Um, I've asked each of the teams to keep their presentation to around 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and for each presentation, uh, we have two discussants, including one from an agency who will need to put a lot of this into practice and one external perspective. Um, each of the two discussants will then have five minutes to lead off the discussion each, uh, and then we'll move to an open Q&A on the presentation. Uh, and hopefully we'll have, uh, we'll leave some time in each of the sessions for a wrap up Q&A at the, the end of each section. Uh, certainly, I know Isolde has planned that for, for the, this first section. We will have an hour break scheduled in the agenda, um, but we do have some flexibility, at least on our side, to, to run into that. Um, however, we will be making a prompt restart at the advertised time. Um, but if for any reason we don't manage to get to your question, uh, or if we don't have time to really get to the bottom of it, if you like, uh, then it would be really great if you could go ahead and post it on our LinkedIn group. Um, which you should certainly join. I think we, we posted the, the slide earlier, but if you're on LinkedIn, you, uh, type in OECD gender and competition policy and join up. Um, and indeed, we'd, we'd really like to, um, if you wanted to post any questions, comments that may occur to you after the conversation, uh, we think that LinkedIn group could be a really useful way to continue to guide the work, uh, both of the individual research teams uh, and their projects, but perhaps more generally of the, of the work that the OECD will be doing to put together a toolkit on the basis of, of some of these insights. Okay, that's enough from me. Um, Isolde, over to you. 
Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks also, Mathilde, for the introduction and welcome today. I'm really pleased to be here to uh, chair this session. Um, as Chris was saying, I'll introduce each of the projects and introduce each of the discussants, then we'll hear from um, the presenters, the discussants, and have some time for the discussion as well. As Chris was saying, we really would like to make this interactive, so please post your questions. And as Chris is saying also that if we don't get to all of them today, we'll be following them up with the presenters afterwards. So it's really useful um, if this discussion both uh, continues here on Zoom and then also on the LinkedIn platform afterwards. So as foreshadowed by Matilda and Chris, these three projects that we're about to hear about both relate to um, cartels and collusion. They have very distinct, three distinct aspects, but, and they use three distinct methodologies, but I think there's also some interrelationship between the three, and that's also something we'd like to bring out in the discussion at the end. So speakers, I'll be keeping an eye on the time as well, and I'll let you know if you're going over time with a, with a warning, <laughs> so we'll make sure that we keep to the, the time as well. So if I'd like to introduce the first presenters, we have Justus Halkup from DICE and Christina Heldman. The discussants after that will be Jamie Smith, a senior economist and from the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission, and Michelle Cleary, a senior consultant from the Battle Group in the USA. Over to you, Justus and Christina. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I will share the slides now, and then Justus will start. <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Isolde. It's, um, we are very happy to present uh, the work on uh, gender and collusion that we have done so far. Uh, it's also work with Holger Rau, who's also here from the University of uh, Göttingen. And uh, very briefly uh, on the motivation of uh, our study, we, we started with the observation that uh, as we are all economists in the industrial economics literature or the competition policy literature, um, the uh, discussion about cartels is mostly on the factors that uh, facilitate cartels is uh, typically um, on the nature of the market. Is the market transparent? How many participants do we have in the market? What's the elasticity of supply and demand and so on? And uh, there's very little uh, discussion actually about the real people who are actually engaged in the cartel. And um, our observation has been that um, often, or sometimes at least, cartels are not really formed between firms, but rather on the, on the individual uh, level between product uh, managers. And um, at that point, we thought, well, obviously, um, cartels require trust because it's an illegal activity. Uh, you are not allowed to engage uh, in cartels. And we know from uh, the literature on behavioral economics and on so from sociology, psychology, and so on, that personal traits and characteristics uh, of people and of groups are decisive whether actually um, trust emerges and is maintained. Uh, so we, we thought, well, one obvious uh, uh, distinguishing factor between people is uh, their gender. So, uh, or uh, put it more bluntly, um, we started to think, well, isn't it more likely that cartels emerge between old boys networks uh, than uh, among mixed teams, uh, actually. And we know from the literature, the experimental literature uh, from psychology and so on, that um, there are on average, uh, of course, differences between uh, men and women. And uh, one of the differences found is that um, women tend to be more, more trusting and also more trustworthy uh, on average. And um, that could lead one to the conclusion that they may be more likely actually to engage in cartels. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also the finding that uh, on average, uh, females tend to be more pro-social uh, actually than uh, male. And of course, uh, cartels are special in the sense that um, you need trust, but you also inflict harm on third parties that are not involved. Uh, so typical, the, the demand side uh, in a cartel. So we thought, well, there may be two countervailing effects, actually. On the one hand, um, uh, uh, females may be more inclined to engage in cartels because they are more trusting and trustworthy. But on the other hand, the cartels are certainly not something that's very pro-social. Uh, so we said, well, that's something that we should uh, or wanted to uh, engage on in some research. And we thought there are different methodologies, but one may be actually to run controlled experiments. And uh, Christina is going to explain what we did so far exactly. Yeah. Okay. 
So, oops. So, um, yeah, to investigate this um, question, we um, are running a laboratory experiment. And we chose this method because we really want to focus on cooperative behavior and therefore we want to rule out confounding factors such as the institutional environment and really um, isolate the choices. And um, in the laboratory, men and women are confronted with the identical situation and um, possible choices. And um, we have a high degree of control over the environment. And this allows us to really um, to precisely elicit the preferences of each um, individual. Um, yeah, so we did an, um, or we're doing an experiment. Um, it is um, conducted online because our physical lab is closed at the moment um, in Düsseldorf. And, um, but recruitment is done using the subject pool of the University of Düsseldorf, um, which includes around 3000 students at the moment. Um, the software that was used is called Zetri Unleashed, which is basically the online version of the standard um, physical lab software, and students um, participate using their web browsers at home. Um, the experiment consists of two parts. Um, the first part is the cooperation problem, which I will describe on the next slide. Um, the second part is the um, elicitation of um, a number of economic preferences and psychological measures because um, we're not only interested in how men and women behave when confronted with a cooperation problem, but also gain insights on what drives their choices. So um, in this second part, we use some small games and questions to elicit um, risk preferences, social preferences, um, guilt aversion, shame and betrayal aversion, which are potential drivers of um, cooperative behavior. So, yeah, so let me quickly talk about the core of the centerpiece of the experiment, which is our cooperation problem. Um, the cooperation problem is based on the classic two person prisoners dilemma, which I assume most of you are familiar with. Um, and to model the consequences um, of collusion on outsiders, such as consumers, we added a third player. Um, and this third player is um, a passive outsider. He or she has no impact on the game but his or her payoffs are affected by the choices of the two active players. In what way, I will talk about in a second. Let's first look at players A and B. So players A and B are our active players and they take on the role of firms facing the opportunity to collude in prices. And if firms individually decide to cooperate and um, if both firms choose a high price, they will get 14 euros each. I don't know if you see my cursor, but if you see it, then this would be this, yeah, this case. However, there's of course always, um, like in a typical prisoner's dilemma, always incentive to deviate and um, choose a low price, which can increase the profit to 16 euros um, at the expense of the other player if he or she chose the high price and, and this other player will then only get eight euros. This is this case or this case. Um, if both firms refrain from collusion and both firms choose um, a low price, they will get 10 euros each. Um, at the beginning of the experiment, after um, participants have uh, filled out a basic socio-demographic um, questionnaire, the roles are allocated. So it is decided whether a player or a student participant is player A, a player B, or player C. And these roles stay constant throughout the entire experiment. Um, the game is played in groups of three. Um, so each group has a player A, a player B, the two active players who play this prisoner's dilemma, and this passive outsider. And um, all players A and B play the prisoner's dilemma twice. In the first stage, they have no information about each other. They are completely anonymous. And um, after having submitted their choices, after having decided whether to um, um, put or ask for low price or high price, they move on to the second stage, the second round. Um, here, groups are reshuffled. So a new player A, player B, player C meet. And um, now the active players receive information about each other. This information is age, duration of study, and most importantly, gender. Um, so yeah, we're of course interested in gender because um, this allows us to identify whether group composition plays a role in um, cooperation. So whether it matters if two men meet, two women meet, or a man and a, or a woman meet. Um, okay, so now let's turn to our passive outsider. Our passive outsider, this player C, is um, present in both stages, but as said before, um, he is completely passive and cannot impact the game. Um, depending on the treatment, his or her payoffs are affected by the choices of A and B, though. Um, there are two treatments. The negative treatment, um, in this treatment, cooperation of A and B imposes a negative externality on C, 
which is basically what happens if two firms uh, collude at the expense of a third player, a third party such as consumers. Um, so in this treatment, C always receives six euros if there's no collusion, but if both firms collude and choose a high price, then player C's payoff is reduced by half and he or she will only get three euros. Um, the other treatment is the baseline treatment where there is no externality and player C always gets six euros. And we chose these two treatments because it allows us to identify um, whether collusive behavior changes when it does not affect an outsider versus when it causes harm for a passive outsider. And we already ran a number of um, sessions and Holger will now give you some insights on our results so far. Okay, then I take over. So if you continue with the slides, yeah, thank you. So yeah, first of all, I have to point out as Chris already said at the very beginning, of course, we are just or we just started with some sessions or so what I will present today are only preliminary results, but anyways, I think they are quite exciting. So as uh, Christina just told, um, the, the first uh, very interesting thing was to check for the general effect on uh, this, uh, or of this negative externality, yeah? so whether people really change their behavior if they uh, harm consumers. And this is what you see in this first uh, diagram here. So first of all, we look at the aggregate results. Yeah? So, so this is a nice thing. We can go step by step through all the data. So in the first step, we just ignore gender. We are just purely interested in this uh, potential effect of harm. What you see here are two bar charts. So the green one is the one without harm. Yeah? So this is the one. Uh, which we call a baseline case. As you can see here, we only have 59 observations, but we will extend this. We just started the data collection. However, and that's the most interesting thing, if you compare the two situations, because uh, the two situations in the baseline treatment with the one where you impose a negative externality on consumers, you see in the black chart that it drops. This is the percentage of collusive behavior. You see that in only 38% of the cases, people behave collusively. So it drops down, so it has some effect if you impose a, a harm on the consumers, which is good news. So our mechanism works. There's a significant difference, which we test with regression analysis. And yeah, this was also already found in some old literature, literature, but the novelty of our results are of course the gender results, which you will find on the next slide. So if you go ahead, uh, Exactly. So here in this next diagram, we only focus on the negative uh, externality treatment yeah, because we just showed that there's uh, this drop in collusive behavior. And now we are interested in the gender effects. Yeah? Um, so on the left hand side, you see the negative externality treatment. And we basically uh, divided it uh, in terms of gender. You see in red color, the women and in blue color, the men. And actually you see the, the main um, decrease in, cart in cartels in the negative externality treatment. This was driven by women who significantly um, uh, form less cartels compared to men. So in only 32 cases, women form a cartel if there's a harm on the outsider, whereas men do so in 44% of the cases. And this is interesting uh, because this is completely novel. And what's interesting is, this is what just used to said at the very beginning. So we also observed the, 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 the known gender effect as soon as we turn off the harm on the consumers, which is on the right hand side, which is the baseline case, that you don't have any consumer. Here you see that women are even slightly more uh, cooperative in the absence of uh, consumers. Yeah? And I guess if we, if we increase the data, this will also be significantly different, which is interesting. So women really, change their behavior as soon as there's harm, they're more nice. If there's no harm, they're also more nice in a way that they're more cooperative. Okay, so if you go ahead to the last slides, we will do some, or we give, we give some information on the potential drivers. As Christina said at the very beginning, what's also nice about the opportunity to run experiments is that you can collect data on the potential channels. Yeah? So, so, so we collected information on preferences of the people and on the psychological um, um, behavior of the people. And I will only uh, focus on the psychological measures because actually there's the most interesting results in there. So we don't find strong effects for risk preferences and uh, therefore I will focus on psychological effects. Here, you only see data of the uh, negative externality treatment. Again, we group uh, the data in terms of women and men, but we again group it in terms of uh, our psychological measures. So we, we focus on guilt and shame aversion. And what you see um, 
here are white and black bars. So the white bars represent the low levels of guilt and shame aversion, and the black bars are high levels of guilt aversion. And what you can see here is the main effect is completely driven by women who feel a very strong degree of guilt and shame aversion. And so in that case, you see that only 27% of the cartels are formed if you're a woman and if you're highly guilt and shame averse. Whereas, and this is quite interesting, in each other case, we always observe nearly the same degree of catalyzation, which is always around 40%. So men don't care about guilt and shame. That doesn't mean that men are not guilt averse. We also find men who are guilt and shame averse. However, for them, it doesn't matter in terms of their uh, collusive behavior, but for women, it matters. So this is our main effect. And if you go to the last slide, and I will quickly wrap up. Um, yeah, um, so what did we find in our um, experimental data so far? So in our preliminary results, we, we, we found that collusion occurs less often when guilt and shame averse women decide, which is interesting. So women really feel, um, um, sorry for uh, the consumers in some uh, extent. And uh, in the next uh, step, so we will increase the sample size and we will focus on the identity effects. This is what Christina told you at the very beginning. We have a stage two in our experimental data. I didn't talk about it today because in terms of this analysis, we need more data because there's more cases. Yeah? So you can, you can focus on cases where men meet men, 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 where men meet women and so on. And currently it's a bit noisy. We need way more data, therefore we extend it. And there's also another project of uh, Justus and Christina. And this is important in terms of increasing the external validity. Yeah? As Christina said at the very beginning, here we have a lab experiment only with students. You can argue, okay, uh, there might be less uh, external validity, but nevertheless, we can really nicely focus on the channels. And therefore, to, 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 to find out more, we need empirical data. And this is what they're doing here. So they focus on data of German competition authority, and they do a deeper analysis, basically, of the role of gender in real cartels. And they focus on an empirical project, which uh, focuses on the involvement of men and women in the organization of cartels. So they get the data by the German competition authority, and they focus, again, on sociodemographic characteristics of the participants, also other social for, uh, factors, which was just mentioned by Justus in the beginning, something like the, the, the cartel brothers and uh, formed networks, how do they communicate, and also some background information on the cartel. So these are basically complements these two projects. OK, so I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Holger. That was perfect timing. Thank you also, Justus and Christina. I'd like to turn now to Jamie Smith, our first discussant. Jamie, are you there? Yes, hello. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Holger and Justus uh, and Christina for a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm Jamie Smith. I'm the chief economist of the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission, uh, speaking to you from the middle of the night. <laughs> Uh, so I thought this is this it's a very very interesting experiment and I thought it was it, it's uh, it's a very exciting way to get into the sort of psychology of cartels um because I think one of the problems that we all have to deal with is that it's not we don't really we're not able to identify cartel participants very easily and they tend not to want to talk about what they've been up to um if you do so I think it, it's a really interesting way of sort of digging into that um one of the really exciting things about this uh, about this this present uh, this presentation this this research is I think the number of possible extensions it has. So we can really sort of use this setup to dig into the psychology of cartel participants in a way that's difficult to do in the real world, as it were, because we we can sort of vary the parameters. I know there was. Um, looking at the sort of value of the, the punishment, looking at things like repeated games, um, sorry, not the punishment, but the, the cost to the outsider, and potentially introducing um, some you know, risk of discovery to the cartel, that kind of thing. I, th I thought it's just, it, its possibilities are endless, as it were. Um, I think one of the things that's particularly interesting to speculate on, from, from my point of view, is the sort of psychological underpinnings of, of, of what's going on here in these decisions to collude. Because we, we talk about sort of old boys clubs and the, the focus of this presentation and, uh, and the, this conference is on the, the boys element of the phrase old boys club. But I mean, the, the, the club part is itself 
also very interesting. People who are involved in cartels are very, you know, they're often embedded in a sort of social network within the firm and between firms that are participants of the cartel, for example. Um, and that might really change the, the, the dynamic of the cartel. It's a repeated interaction. It's, a, it's an interaction with people you know, and where you, you might sort of owe some sort of loyalty to um, the, the, other, the other participants or perceive yourself to do that. And I think one of the things that was really interesting to me about this research was looking at this guilt and shame um, idea, because in that circumstance, it's easy to see that guilt and shame would have this one effect. You can see, well, you'll you'll feel guilty about hurting the passive player, uh, but in in circumstances in in a cartel, in some circumstances, it's easy to think of uh, of conditions in which you might feel guilty about hurting your prospective cartel co participants as well. And this is something which is obviously tricky to build. Into, into the research, uh, but I think it would be a very interesting extension to see whether you could find any effect of guilt and shame on their willingness to harm the, the co-conspirators, as, as it were, potentially by burying the payoffs or, or that sort of thing. So I think that's a very interesting point. Um, one further th point that I wanted to bring up is, is I, I would be interested to see, because I, I don't know how many people at this conference are from competition agencies in developing countries. But one thing that I think would be an interesting point to explore would be to look at different demographic groups uh, and the way, th whether this research turns up the same results if you move between demographic groups. Because th there's something in the sort of social psychology literature which comes up a lot called the uh, weird problem. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the weird problem, it's that people from Western uh, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic countries sometimes provide slightly different outcomes and psychological tests to the rest of the world. Um, and also tend to make up the vast bulk of the social psychology literature's subjects. Um, so, and the, the, you know, these differences can be quite pronounced in terms of the way people perceive the world. People for, in this, this sort of weird group uh, are often more individualistic in the way that they, that they perceive the world and this sort of thing. And I think it would just be fascinating to see whether you could extend this research into other groups, both within um, German society, within other, other OECD member states, and then also try it in some developing countries. Because it, as I say, there are these sort of potentially quite pronounced differences just in the way people perceive um, the nature of these harms to consumers, the nature of their obligations to other members of the firm and other co-cartel participants and it would just i think that the the sort of potential applications there and it's sort of expansions of this research there would be really really interesting because it would really help us to dig into not just the nature of cartels but also the sort of psychological underpinnings of cartel participants to see how they vary not just between men and women but between men and women in different societies and it would be i think from our point of view um dealing with cartel enforcement in, in, a, in a developing state. It would be really interesting to see, it would be really interesting from our point of view to see whether the same dynamics show up here. So it, you know, a potential sort of extension there. Um, hey, Jamie, that, just given- am I, am I running out of time? Just a little bit over if you could wrap it up, thanks. Uh, okay, I, I'm happy to wrap up that uh, because I, I have, Yes, I have too much to say. Well, we might actually have some chance for a bit of back and forth. What I might do now is just turn to Michelle Cleary as the second discussant, and then we'll have a bit of time maybe for a response from the presenters and see if we can also get a few um, questions in from the floor before we move on. Michelle Cleary, welcome. Thanks so much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yep. Great. Uh, I'm Michelle Cleary. I'm a senior consultant with the Brattle Group, which is an economic consulting firm very pleased to be here today and really appreciated this first presentation and Jamie's comments. So uh, in my first set of thoughts are, I've been thinking deeply about whether there are gender differences in the propensity to collude. And like Jamie, I thought that one could uh, explore the psychology and, and in particular, the personality characteristics of executives and leaders at various levels and how that relates to gender 
again, looking at both the economics and the psychology literature. And numerous psychology studies show that individuals high in narcissism are more likely to be selected into leadership roles at all levels across all sectors. In terms of um, the research on gender and narcissism, men tend to be more narcissists than women across certain dimensions of narcissism. And those include the exploit exploitative entitlement facet and the leadership and authority facet. And the studies show that men are more likely to exploit others, which I think uh, shows up in your research too, and that they believe that they're uh, special and entitled to privileges. Uh, and men are also more likely, as I stated, to exert authority. Um, in terms of career success, the psychology, psychology studies also find links to the dark triad, and they show that narcissism is positively related to salary and Machiavellianism, which is more highly correlated with men, is positively related to leadership position and career satisfaction. So we might want to consider whether certain stereotypical masculine personality traits, including these types and levels of narcissism, such as entitlement and sense of self-worth and lack of consideration for others, coupled with Machiavellianism, where the end justifies the means, uh, uh, show up um, with um, cartel hotheads and, and if they, as they tend to lend themselves to uh, winning at all costs bad behaviors um, and are often tied to corruption, the psychology, psychology studies will show you. Uh, Corn Ferry, um, uh, which is a group that looks at uh, CEOs, uh, did a study in 2017 where they identified characteristics of female CEOs and contrasted those to male CEOs. And um, what they found was female CEOs uh, appear to more highly value the contributions of others and um, find that they can't single-handedly uh, bend the future to their will. They also find that female CEOs deviated from the CEO benchmark in terms of humility, confidence, credibility, and openness to difference. Again, this could suggest that female CEOs um, exhibit traits that are less win at any cost um, or which perhaps could suggest that they have less propensity to, to collude or for corruption. Um, in terms of the presentation, which again, I thought was terrific, um, I agree with many of the things you're looking at and I agree that it makes sense to look at individuals instead of firm and market level incentives and also personal characteristics as you're doing. And um, while collusive agreements, as you point out, may be formed without knowledge of uh, the board of directors or the management committee, um, and instead by product managers, for example, um, product managers are still in leadership roles. And um, as I previously noted, it may make sense to look at the personality traits of leaders at all levels of management as done in the psychology literature. Um, I also found guilt and shame to be a very interesting angle and I appreciate the illumination on that. Um, I'm wondering whether guilt and shame can be correlated to these personality traits and subsequently to gender and of course, how we might measure it, right? So it's it would be a challenge, but if we could measure it experimentally or empirically, these personality traits that may make men more likely to collude and, and how, I'm also curious how you all measure guilt. Um, and, and you might, uh, um, I also um, was wondering, um, uh, and I know you intend to get into this in terms of your compliments in your next phase, but one idea is to look at um, the, as it relates to guilt and shame, the potential for publicity and exposure as relates to guilt and shame. Maybe certain whether it's, a, uh, you see this behavior in certain industries, sleepy industry versus one with a huge market cap, a finished good versus a raw material. Maybe uh, with the latter, folks are, are less connected to the finished product, the final consumer, and that could uh, relate to uh, your guilt and shame studies. So there's potentially a linkage uh, there and, and perhaps to the personality trait studies that I uh, previously mentioned. And I think I'm out of time, so that, that wraps up my comments. Thanks, Michelle. We might turn to the presenters and see if there are any responses there. Maybe starting off with that um, point that Jamie was making about the diversity of the pool, which is also something that's been picked up in the chats too about how that could be expanded and some of the cultural differences. If I could turn to one of the presenters to respond. Yeah, maybe just I, I take it up. Um, it's uh, I think these are all actually excellent uh, comments. And as you all have seen, we are sort of at the beginning of a journey and not uh, at the end uh, of the journey. So it's uh, there's there many more factors actually to to explore. I, I think we all completely agree 
that um, of the various factors that you highlighted, the cultural context, the uh, different personality traits that we haven't explored yet, uh, um, that uh, different types of subject pools. Uh, for This is some, all, all something that we intend to build on uh, over time. And it, in, in, in addition, also something that we try to explore uh, jointly with the Bundeskartellamt, uh, actually, who is helping us on our complementary um, research. Um, of course, it is not so straightforward because typically something like uh, did uh, the cartelist go to the same school is not data collected by competition agencies uh, because it's typically not relevant uh, to the decision um, so we have a sort of uh, not the data that we would like to have as researchers uh, uh, but still we try to f sort of approximate some of the issues for example um, if we look at different industries uh, just to give you an example in the rail track cartels is virtually all men uh, networks there were no females uh, engaged and then we have other industries which are more like uh, consumer goods industries we have, where we have many more females in leadership roles uh, for example so this is something that we try to explore as well does the sort of industry structure in the sense of the the gender industry structure um, uh, play a role uh, in, in in the uh, propensity to catalyze uh, um, but as said, yeah, uh, I think these are extremely valuable uh, uh, points, and uh, it, it's an endless sort of idea, pool of ideas uh, that we get, and we are all excited about them. Before we move on to the next project, would we be able to just quickly touch on that element of the um, the guilt and shame and how that was measured? Yeah, Holger, about from Holger, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree that this is probably the most exciting story. And uh, also in terms of the last uh, discussion, uh, I have to add that that's indeed gender differences, right? I um, mean, actually not quite surprising. So women are more guilt averse and shame averse than uh, men. But anyways, uh, just focusing on the correlation, you only find that uh, uh, connection for women, right? And in terms of the measurement, it was kind of a questionnaire. Actually, it's a big quest uh, questionnaire battery with different questions. The funny thing is kind of you present people with different questions of daily life, basically, yeah? And uh, actually they have to state on a Likert scale how much they agree to this kind of situation, for instance. And there's many funny stories about it, for instance, that there's some cases uh, where a friend of you asks you to look for his dog and then the dog runs away and then you have to think about how bad you feel about this or something like that. Then you have to state it yeah? or, or you damage something at the party uh, and would you tell this uh, the, the host or something like that. And this is quite interesting. Yeah? And this is the way how we measure guilt and shame. And this is standardized in psychology. This is a standardized question, questionnaire, which is very often used in psycholo the psychology to classify people based on this, basically. Thank you, Holger. I think what we might do is there have been a few additional questions in the chat. We might hold them over to the end if we have time and move on to the other presentations now too, because I think there's some interesting cross discussion between the, the projects. So if I could now introduce uh, Juan Borrell from the University of Barcelona and Carmen Garcia. They're going to be talking about the role of gender in management boards in relation to cartels. The discussants who will be joining us then are Lilian Severino, the Deputy Chief Economist of Cade Brazil, and uh, Inez Neves, a lecturer of uh, law at the Faculty of the University of Porto and also a private practitioner. Welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Very interesting first project. So thank you, Zoe, uh, for giving us the, the screen. I'm John Ramon Borrell, and I will just offer some uh, introductory remarks. Um, and then I will hand the screen over to Carmen, and the, the leading researcher of, of our project. So, so in the name of all team members, uh, you, you have all the names in the screen, um, I would like first uh, to thank the OCD and the Canadian Competition Bureau for selecting and funding our research proposal and for organizing this, this kickoff workshop. It's going to be amazing, for sure. Um, we are happy, as, as the previous project was saying, to, to share the preliminary results uh, of our projects. We have been working hard uh, to meet that deadline. Uh, and get comments and suggestions uh, from our discussants, Lillian and Inesh, and from the other research teams and the rest of participants. Um, our project focuses on analyzing whether there is a gender bias in cartel engagement, yeah? whether there is um, gender bias in creating, keeping alive uh, the cartel, um, and if so, how, how we should consider the role of gender 
when designing uh, anti-cartel law enforcement. Okay, so in an audience like, like this one, probably we don't have to go uh, to the details of why this is uh, a fight that is very important. But what is newer, I think, is what we, we were talking about, I think, uh, in the presentation of the first project, that um, um, is increasingly shared that, that understanding this creation, management, and eventual breakup of a cartel, the, the firm's senior management plays, plays a key role. So there's some agents there that, that are key, maybe the board members, and maybe the management committee, as we were discussing, product managers, uh, that are important. Um, the, the nice and interesting thing from empirical people as, as we are, is that we are observing significant changes in the, in the gender balance of management boards. Um, so, so what we aim is to identify if, if changes in, in gender composition of the boards have any impact on firms' cartel activity, looking at the data, the recent data. So if so, we, we finally aim to be able to obtain policy implications for the design and enforcement of competition and gender policies for, for both, as Matilde was saying at, at the very beginning, um, that was important for the OCD. Um, so after, after this motivation, I will briefly frame the, the main previous contributions that are at the basis of our research, uh, uh, at the basis of our, our estimates, what we want to estimate. And then I will hand the screen over to Carmen, who is going to offer you the preliminary empirical findings and what we plan um, to do during the following months up to the, the next meeting. Okay, okay so, so there, there is a growing literature uh, that, that shows that there seems to be gender differences, particularly in the response of women and men when they face free situations. I think with the first project we were discussing about that on average. There are differentials, uh, and and this is this this response is critical for their decision making processes. Um, although the, the evidence is still somehow mixed, so, some studies are showing that women are more risk averse than men on average. Uh, women seem to be more receptive to moral and ethical norms and more prone to whistleblowing. Okay, this was the discussion of the first project. So taking on these discussions and going on, so. Uh, these differences have encouraged the, the research on analyzing board gender diversity and the effect of gender quotas on corporate boards that have been introduced in several countries around the world during the last years. So gender diversity have gradually and, and moderately increased. So analyzing the impact of these changes is also of interest, right? Um, in fact, the literature is showing evidence of the impact of gender diversity on corporate decisions already. Um, showing that the increase in women on, on senior management positions increase first performance, decrease in legal activities such as financial misconduct and corruption. Um, so there is a gap on studying how public policy should take that into account, those gender issues, when designing enforcement tools. Um, and this is particularly the case for competition uh, uh, policy. Okay, so we follow the proposals of, of Stephanie Santa Creu Bazut and, and Chris Pike back 2018. They were already highlighting a gap in the literature, studying how gender may be affecting anti-competitive conduct by firms. Um, and as far as we know, there is only two empirical papers that study gender and cartels. Alawi 2018 showed that firms engaging in cartels sanctioned in the UK had less women in executive and board positions than other similar firms. And Christopher and Andrews, um, 2018, also showed that the percentage of women involved in price conspiracies in international cartels is also smaller than the percentage of women in boards. So it seems that women uh, participate less than potentially in, in conspiracies. Other papers single out that cartel sanctions lead to management restructuring. That's interesting, and we'll see that this is interesting for our research. So we think that there is a, still a gap on the literature aiming at identifying and quantifying econometrically using causal inference techniques, the effect of corporate board gender composition um, on cartel activity. So this is the gap we, we, we aim to fill with this project. Okay, so after this brief literature review, uh, Carmel will present to you our progress in setting up a novel data set, designing a causal inference strategy and obtaining some prelim results, okay? 
and she will also explain what, what we plan next. Okay, so thanks. So, Carmen, the, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, John Ramon. So, in order to start exploring the relationship between gender composition of corporate boards and cartel activity, we have worked with a data set composed by European firms that have been sanctioned by different competition authorities due to their engagement in cartel cases. And this information comes from Connor's database. In particular, we look at the period from 2010 to 2019 for two reasons. Firstly, because there is more information available regarding board's composition. And secondly, due to the time constraints we've had. Um, therefore, our database consists of 52 cartelized firms plus other 52 similar non-cartelized firms. And by similar, we mean firms from the same country, from the same sector, and with similar operating revenues. After incorporating the information of board's composition, we end up with an unbalanced panel data of around 40 to 50 firms per group, depending on the year. Regarding cartel duration, uh, we have, sorry, regarding cartels, we have focused on those starting uh, in 2010 or after. Uh, the maximum cartel duration in our sample is six years, and the average duration is about two years and a half. Uh, in our analysis, we compare the gender composition in boards of cartelized firms with respect to their counterpart or similar non-cartelized firm. And also how the boards of these two groups compare before, during, and after the cartel period. Now, let me give you a spoiler of the results obtained uh, from this initial analysis carried out so far. We find some complementarities uh, between anti-cartel and gender policies. And let me show you why. So to analyze the data, we start with some descriptive statistics. In this plot, uh, we represent the average percentage of women in boards of director over time for cartelized firms, the blue dotted line, and for non-cartelized firms, the red dotted line. We can see in this figure how the presence of women in boards increases over time for these two groups. Also, this increase seems to be driven by the quota target of the country of the countries included in our sample, for which there exists some variability, given that we have some countries with binding quotas and some other countries with non-binding quotas. The mean target quota represented in this figure considers both binding and non-binding quotas, and we can see that this main target quota increases over time, especially from 2014 onwards. We aim to explore more in detail this exogenous variation in the in these coming months. Still, these gender policies affect both groups of cartelized and non-cartelized firms, given that given that the cartelized firm and its counterpart belong to the same country. However, from this graph, uh, the presence of women seems to be higher in cartelized firms. Then the question is, are the differences between the two groups significant? And the answer is no. We find no statistically uh, significant difference in the presence of women in cartelized firms versus non-cartelized firms by year, as we can see from the coefficient estimates and the confidence intervals represented in this figure, except for the year uh, 2019. It should be noted that the differences here are estimated using our regression, including country fixed effects and firms characteristics, while in the previous graph, uh, we only reported simple things. So uh, once we have analyzed the presence of women on boards over time, uh, we find no differences between the two groups. Also, the driver explaining the increase of the presence of women over time in the two groups seems to be the implementation of these target quotas in the countries of, of our sample. Now, the question is, what happens with the presence of women, of women in boards of directors of cartelized firms before, during, and after the cartel period? And also, what happens in the case of non-cartelized firms? Well, in this figure, we represent the percentage of women in boards for cartelized firms, again, blue dotted line, and for non-cartelized firms, again, red dotted line, but now during the cartel life. 
So we can see the behavior of the two groups in the periods before the cartel starts. And the cartel start is represented by this, uh, by the first vertical line on the left. Then during the cartel period, which lasts up to the second orange line and after the cartel breaks up. Uh, it should be noted that not all cartels last for all the periods represented here, nor do we have information for the periods before or after cartelization. So there is some sample attrition as the number of periods increase. Anyhow, what we see in this graph is that the presence of women is similar in both groups of firms before car the cartel starts. And then during the cartel period, the presence of women increases a bit more in the group of cartelized firms. However, after the cartel breakup, after the, the second oral line, um, we can see that the presence of women seems to be higher in the group of cartelized firms than in the group of non-cartelized firms. And this is where the complementarities between competition policy and gender policy may show up. In fact, we have estimated a simple logic regression to analyze whether the presence of women affects the probability of forming a cartel, and uh, we find no significant effect in this case. However, when we analyze the probability of cartel breakup, we find a positive and significant effect of the presence of women on the probability of cartel breakup, as hinted also in the previous graph. Now, getting a little bit more into detail, we analyze whether there are significant differences in the percentage of women of cartelized and non-cartelized firms. Again, uh, the differences represented in this graph come from a, a regression, including country fixed effects and firms characteristics, while in the previous graph, we only represented uh, simple means. Now we find no statistically significant difference between the two groups before the cartel starts, non during the cartel period. However, we find some significant differences between the two groups after the cartel breakup, uh, in particular from the second year after cartel breakup until the fourth year, the coefficients are significant, which indicates that cartelized firms have a higher presence of women than non-cartelized firms. What do we plan next? Well, uh, first of all, we will keep working with this data and carry out some more robustness checks of our causal inference analysis in order to analyze uh, the direction of causality. We also plan to analyze further the variation in the gender policies implemented in the countries included in our sample. Moreover, we will also work with an, uh, an additional data set of Spanish firms for which we have information on senior management. In this case, the time frame for the Spanish firms is wider from approximately 2000 to 2018. And again, we will distinguish between cartelized and non-cartelized firms, and we will carry out um, causal inference analysis. To sum up, uh, after this preliminary analysis, the remaining question uh, are, does the presence of women induce cartel breakup as or in the line of the results uh, of the logic regression? Or on the contrary, is it the case that the presence of women increases after cartel breakup um, as port restructuring is balancing gender composition as hinted by the, by the difference in the presence of women between the two groups um, after the cartel breaks up? As mentioned before, we will keep on working to identify the, the nature and direction of causality and therefore of these policy complementarities. And then depending on the answer to these questions, we hopefully are able to come up soon with uh, one of these touchy lessons. The first one is if you are concerned about gender balance in boards, competition policy may be the remedy or in the fight against cartels, gender quotas may be effective antitrust tools. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. We look forward to receiving the comments from our discussants, Lilian and Ines, and from other research teams and also from the rest of participants. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you, Juan Roman. Um, Lilian, are you there? Can we start off with you, please? Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm so pleased, I'm so pleased to be here with you. I'm Lilian Severino, the Deputy Chief Economist, the Brazilian Authority, Competition Authority. 
And first, I would like to thank the staff of the OECD Gender Inclusive Competition Policy Project, especially Chris Pike, for the invitation to be here and talking about what is the current paramount issue. Since cartels are seen as per se competition infringement, studies related to the behavior of management boards are important to understand what is behind the decision making process and that leads someone to engage in a collusion. The topic of gender bias and cartel engagement was approached very well by the authors. Today, my speech will focus on suggesting methodological ideas to encourage a few potential improvements to this study, especially regarding the economic model applied for BIT and some assumptions about risk aversion. My main idea is I. We must be careful about the assumption that women are more risk averse than men. Despite previous uh, study indicating this idea, we can have differing effects when we talk about specific groups such as management boards and especially hotheads. In addition, there may be contradictions in being more risk averse and more likely to report misconduct due to the fear of retaliation. We are talking about a database with different firms and countries. I understand the limitation of the valuable data and I appreciate the effort uh, to link cartelized and non-cartelized firms. But when we're looking at a variable behavior as a percentage of women in boards of directors before, during, and after a specific event like a cartel, I think it's important to consider some relevant factors to control effects that might not be totally uh, related to gender bias. For example, we need to consider that some industries are more likely to have collusion, such as those of homogeneous products without direct distributes, as well as demand stability and market transparency. Thinking, about, thinking more about it, it's important to consider socio-demographic and cultural aspects. Indeed, we could have different results if the competition authority had implemented behavior remedies or only imposed penalties on the cartel's case selected. About the econometric model, I would recommend presenting the estimated probability equation with the coefficient, the coefficients you found and the interpretation of the coefficient. And in addition, for a more accurate model, I would suggest the addition for a residual diagnostic test, such as normality and homostasy tests. And finally, as you have uh, data about periods before, during, and after the cartel, as well as cartelized and non cartelized firms, maybe you could try to find out firms with a similar pre collusion trend. And using the differences in difference methodology, we can try to understand if the collusion affected the gender composition of management boards. And more interesting, I would suggest you to apply the difference in difference with leads and legs to identify if there is an anticipatory effect linked to change in boards composition that is not related to the cartel. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lilian. If we could now turn to Inez, and then we'll have some res responses from the panelists. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for this tremendous presentation. I begin by complimenting my session colleagues and the audience, as well as the OECD team uh, for putting all this together. So my first note on the project gender bias in cartel engagement is definitely and without doubt of congratulation for the work developed so far and a personal note on the breadth of fresh air that it offers us for the discussion on the relationship between competition policy and the protection and enforcement of other public values and fundamental rights. 
as a matter of fact, while avoiding the debate on the real goals of competition policy and the likelihood of internalizing the promotion of social values as well, this project is a real proof of how one may, after all, find a common soul between competition policy and the fight against gender-based discrimination. Um, while it is true that different policies may sometimes clash with each other and the solution for such a conflict or collision will, in that case, rely on what in constitutional law we call implicit limits or uh, waiting exercise, it is also possible that they may actually complement each other and point in the same direction. And this project really teaches us that the relationship between these different policies and values, in particular competition on the one hand and equality on the other, uh, is not necessarily about letting a certain value prevail over another, but on the contrary, may also be a relationship of complementarity in a win-win situation. Uh, this being said, <clears throat> I will briefly raise some points on which I would like to hear your thoughts and that may be relevant for the improvement or the discussion over this project. Uh, first, and endorsing here Lillian's thoughts regarding the consideration of women as a homogeneous category, I will just like to stress that from a legal perspective as well, considering women as such may be misleading since frequently we have uh, what we consider to be uh, intersectional discrimination, whereby we have not only gender, but a combination of factors such as race, ethnicity, education, uh, that may all uh, influence even more the results of a research like this. Also, and in particular regarding women on boards, it will be important not only to distinguish the quality of insider and outsider, this is the question of whether the women in the sample were when appointed to the board of directors, were already employees of the, the company or not, uh, this, in this case outsiders, but also something that you analyze, which is the number of women in the board, which is important for the question of knowing whether the presence of more than one may lead to significant, uh, significantly different results when compared to firms that only count with one woman, who may in that case be subject to what is uh, called a tokenization effect. In light of this, uh, it seems to me that perhaps in the in a future research, it will be important to study the extent to which a combination of factors such as gender and age on the one hand or gender and race on the other may mu modify the results presented. Uh, in any case, and confining myself here to the object, I would just like to stress the need to avoid this holistic consideration of women. This leads me to a second note, which is to reinforce the relevance of an analysis that considers the impact of legislation and other national measures regarding quotas. For me, this is of the utmost import importance to compare the results achieved with those presented in some studies that already found a negative impact of quotas on the company's performance. Finally, I will end with a personal uh, note on the need for us all to finding a concrete place and a proper role for such findings in competition policy. Otherwise, this will only be a good conversation, which does not do justice uh, to the importance of these results. Uh, so it is my view that if this positive relationship between gender bias and cartel engagement uh, is confirmed, it will be necessary to identify to what extent it could be considered and have a proper place in the design of competition policy. I ask, uh, would such conclusions favor the support of compliance programs that include aspects related with companies' corporate governance, such as gender board diversity? Would regulators value such programs, for instance, as mitigating circumstances in, the term, in determining the level of sanctions? Or if we pass on to leniency and whistleblowing, do you think that considering and really looking at women's different incentives may lead us to the conclusion that the focus should not be on a monetary reward, but rather on the protection against retaliation and anonymity? 
This is, do these conclusions show us a need to rethink the incentives embedded in the law? Finally, and uh, to sum up, will this mutual influence add more arguments in favor of binding quotas? Or conversely, would such a forced introduction result in negative and artificial outcomes? Well, and these were just some ideas that your project brought to mind, but, but and again, thank you for providing us with such an inspiring project and results, both of them so far. <laughs> Thank you, Inez and Lillian. There was a lot, lot to cover there. That was excellent. Maybe if I turn to Joanne um, and to Carmen and uh, you touch on the ones that you think you want to respond to now, but what's really interesting, I think, is how that will inform some of the discussion afterwards. Over to you. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you both Lillian and Inez. Very, very interesting uh, comments. Uh, Carmen, if you are okay, um, I, I may just start with some more general questions and then we can go to the details of the yeah. estimations, uh, okay? Yeah. Um, first of all, with, with respect to the, to the Lillian's comment, our assumptions, that's true, okay? We, 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 review, we review the literature, but it's true that when we, when we do these um, causal inference exercises, we need to have like an estimate, right? Something like a, an hypothesis, a prior, right? And yeah, as, as in the previous project, uh, on average, um, we, we find this, this, um, uh, this less risk aversion, although it's not very clear on, on the, on the uh, empirical um, uh, published papers uh, uh, up to today, right? So, so we leave that and then with these hypotheses uh, that, that may be maybe not correct, we, we let the data talk <laughs> and, and see what's going on there. And, and it's true that, that we need to frame, we, 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 we look for these similar firms to have like a control, okay? So uh, so for your question about the diff and diff, that was the idea, right? We needed a control. We, 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 we didn't want to have only the variation within the, the cartelized firms. So we, we wanted to have a control there. And, and it was really important as, as, uh, as we saw that, that the percentage of women was increasing across the board, all firms. Uh, that we are studying, right? And, and then this drives to the issue of, of um, Inesh about that, the gender quotas, right? For us in the analysis, it's really important to have this policy already implemented with binding or non-binding character, uh, because then we know that this is some the part, at least part of this increase in the percentage of women is driven by the policy. Because if not, if we may have like problems of endogeneity, we don't know exactly what's going on. If, if it's an introduction of, of women, something that is doing the French by themselves. And, and the problem with that is that then it's going to be difficult. Um, what we see is that there is an interaction there, this complementarity, then claiming to introduce more of these policies, that could be an, an implication, a policy implication that, that may help. Although probably, Mm. is not only the, this estimate that is, should drive that, right? Because you, you were raising uh, mm, in your comment about, it's not only about gender, it's about race, about uh, ethnicity, other discrimination. So, uh, okay, we find this, that this is effective. It seems to be working, right? But okay, but sometimes some policies work, but we don't want to them, right? Because we, we, we don't like them. From, from ethical or moral consideration, right? So, so this last step is a little bit uh, like jumping in the in other side, okay? Uh, Carmen, I think we have a, 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 the question of Lillian about the uh, controlling factors and maybe yeah. the diff and diff, you want to jump in? Yeah, so uh, I wanted to say just a few things regarding the, the sectors. This is a very good comment and we are aware of it, but with such a small sample we have right now, we cannot draw any conclusion or do separate analysis for, for different sectors. We try to be careful in the sense of for a cartelized firm, when looking for the similar firm, we match it in the same sector. But uh, for now, we don't have enough information. Hopefully with the, the, the Spanish cases, we are a bit, hopefully we're able to say something more on this. Also regarding the, the socio-demographic characteristics of 
boards of women, we don't have that information. Of course, it would be very interesting to, to analyze all these things such as um, years of experience, age, et cetera, et cetera, but we don't have such a detailed information. And then, uh, yes, regarding the, the difference in difference, this is with leads and lags, this is what, what we represent it, right? In the, in the figures of differences, this is a difference in difference, given that we have the non-cartelized firm and the cartelized firm, and then we have uh, the periods. The only issue here, and this is what we try to give us a message of our presentation, is that we find this relationship between uh, collusion and presence of women, but um, we still need to identify the, the direction of, of causality, right? Because when then when we do the probit and we see that the presence of women affects the probability of cartel breakup, but when we represent it the other way around, right? The presence of women with respect to cartel period, we find that relationship there. So I think that exploiting the, the, the variation in this policy, the binding and non-binding quotas, exploiting this exogenous variation, we will able to identify the direction of causality. But so far we haven't got into that, right? We need to find the, the proper instrument, which is the policy, but to work a bit more um, with our regressions to find the, the proper direction. For now, we just represented these uh, relationships in the two ways and we will find the the, yeah, the, the direction of causality. But thank you very much for the comments. Thank you, Carmen. We had a couple of questions in the chat more about the data and detail, which I'm not sure we have time for, which we'll pass on. But one of them was just a point of clarification with the Connor database, which I think I already know the answer to, but was whether from the cartel decisions, whether you could actually know whether uh, the board had was aware of the cartel behavior. So was the decision to cartelize something that the board was aware of? Do you have are you do you have that data? No, I don't think we we don't have that data. Yeah, I don't think this that's is in something. Common, yeah, we yeah. I mean, cartel data that. comes from from Conos database. Uh, as we said, we have yeah. the the name of the company, uh, but no, we we cannot know this information. And in, in the database, that there is there sometimes they dig the. They have a name of of of, the, of some of the directors yeah. that were mm. directly uh, mm. in uh, in the price conspiracy, but not not for many firms. So mm. there's there's quite a lot of blanks there. So yeah. so we resort uh, to to have a look on on the information on 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 the boards and on, on the actual information on on uh, any person that was involved in the board uh, instead yeah. of just looking at this. Uh, very few information on some of the, the directors that were really um, engaged in the price conspiracy. Yeah, thank you. Here we go. We'll move on to the third presentation so we can hopefully have some time at the end to discuss all three. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Alexis Brunel from the Authority de la Concurrence. Oh. And can you hear me? and yes. Carolina, can you Carolina Abate. Yes, I can. Okay. Um, the discussants of this section are going to be Maria Manuela Pal um, Palacio from the Colombian Competition Authority and Sarah Long, who's a partner at Euclid Law in the UK. So turning over to Alexi and Carolina, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Isolde. Uh, and, and thanks uh, to the, the previous discussants for uh, that, their very interesting presentations. Um, here, once, once again, we're, we're, we start by trying to find a relationship between gender structure of firms and the perpetration, concealment, and underreporting of cartels. And we formed the hypothesis that it's not about the essential nature of men and women, but it's really about the social structure. And in, in, in our work, we focus on the preservation of shared values, loyalty, homosocial patterns as a key factor for the maintenance of cartel practices. We built a theoretical framework based on behavioral economics, cartel studies, white color crime, gender studies. And we combine this framework with a systematic analysis of French cartel cases. So basically that means that we take the public decisions, we count the men and women in them, and we look at what they're doing, what they're saying to each other. Uh, and what, what's one key element is that we look at the actual participants in cartels within the, within the, the decisions. But we start with uh, what we know uh, about behavioral economics and, and cartels. And 
as has already been mentioned, recent work has applied behavioral economics to competition law and in particular to cartels to enrich a little bit the previous rational agent um, uh, paradigm. And now we know that the cartels is about humans. It's about human agents acting on a broad variety of personal psychological factors. These humans also act within firms and professional networks that also have collective values and cultures. And so we see in decisions that people resort very frequently to social norms such as loyalty, trust, respect for precedent, preservation of the sector, the reputation of the profession, et cetera, et cetera. In our ongoing analysis of um, cartel cases since 2010, we find in particular in almost all cases, typical what we call locker room or boys club vocabulary, such as loyalty, trust, pact, friends, equitable, fair, treason, usage, and collusion is called healthy competition, whereas deviation destabilizes the market. One of my favorites is in one decision, they use the word knighting for welcoming a new participant into the, in, into the cartel. Another interesting point is the use of the, the French word confrère, which relates to both pre-industrial market organization and the idea of brotherhood. And looking at interviews in case files, you see also how personal contacts are made and transmitted when participants change. This will link to gender studies on professional networks. We have seen numerous studies showing that women who perform executive functions are indeed often considered as outsiders by established groups within firms and professional networks. Women will often be considered as outsiders or mavericks because first, they usually tend to be recruited outside of personal and social networks in boards or in units, notably through search agencies, whereas men will be more um, recruited through those per personal networks. And also they are mavericks because they tend to question policy and bring out sensitive, sensitive issues, sorry, more. Why is that the presence of women is indeed potentially disruptive of the established social order, which is based on implicit but very entrenched loyalties. This position we find is largely due to structural and situational factors. This is reflected also in past cases. The presence of women in the practices forces to do away with implicit talks. The, 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 the way discussions are made changes, we see that. There are less veiled reference or implicit talks and more open discussions. Things are stated clearly when women are part of the discussion. And when they do participate in cartels in a capacity equal to that of male participants, which is, uh, as, you, as you may know, really the minority of cases that are most of them, they are only men. But when they are present, the weight of interpersonal uh, relationship diminishes. We talk less about loyalty and talk more about objective reference to the policy pursued by the firm. It, it becomes an objective policy of the firm. And we have one interesting element that is in a very recent case, the change from one man to a woman in one of the participants led to much fewer contacts less consistent application of the cartel, leading the French authority to grant something that is very rare, a fine reduction for a, a, a type of um, mitigating circumstances called maverick behavior. And in, on that note, I will give the floor to my colleague, Thorina. Thank you. I will address our La, the last part of our research, which focuses on uh, white collar crimes in particular. So the role of the different factors that have been mentioned. So um, social norms, informal network dynamics, behavioral considerations and gender um, has been analyzed with respect to a variety of white collar crimes, but we have not found such literature on cartels. Um, we know that cartels are a different type of conduct, but parallels can be made between cartels and other white-collar crimes. 
and this will allow us to complement the evidence from past cartel cases with meaningful lessons from the literature on the gender white collar crime nexus. So the existing studies consider uh, multiple variables that can explain human behavior in white collar crimes and show that men and women do not behave in the same way, not because of intrinsic differences such as the higher moral or ethical standards in women, but due to social dynamics. So the so-called boys club dynamic. Uh, in particular, a number of papers highlight the importance uh, for white collar crimes of homosocial trust in uh, male dominated networks and show, for example, that common gender enables private information sharing. Um, other studies demonstrate that changes of net to network dynamics have an impact on the likelihood of illicit behavior. Uh, overall, uh, what emerges from the literature is that dominant group networks at the corporate level tend to be composed of mostly men. These serves both instrumental and friendship functions. Uh, the literature shows that this leads to a consistent and substantial limitation to women's participation in informal and professional networks, which are key for white collar crimes dynamics, and therefore to minimal and marginal female involvement in uh, corporate cr criminal networks. So what we believe and we will try to show fully uh, in our research is that by taking a cross disciplinary approach that goes beyond economic incentives and rationality. A similar analysis can be conducted for cartels and similar results uh, can be found. Um, in particular, what we found is that this literature is consistent with the evidence from uh, past cartel cases uh, um, from the French competition authorities. Um, for example, when women enter a cartel that is based on a long lasting interpersonal network, interactions with other members appear more limited, as Alexi was saying. In other instances, uh, presence of women is short lived and the female representatives are quickly replaced by men, which are more familiar with the social circle that is involved in the cartel. Um, however, I think this is a very important point. When women uh, create common gender cooperation, we do observe efficient cartel participation. So overall, I would say the main point to retain here is that we don't find cartels that are based on informal networks where men and women are mixed and equals. Um, at this stage of our analysis, um, the research is limited both in scope and in depth. In scope, because we have focused only on the enforcement petition authority, over a period of about 10 years. And we need to take into account that the majority of the cartels that we have uh, do not include female participants at all. So we need to take into account that uh, most economic sectors are strongly male dominated. And the analysis is also limited in that because as um, previous presenters were um, saying, uh, decisions published by competition authorities are generally limited to factor considerations necessary to demonstrate the existence of the infringement. So we will have to dig deeper um, to find uh, the relevant evidence of the intersex dynamics that uh, are not shown uh, so openly. However, at this stage, both convincing theoretical foundations and compelling factual evidence confirm that there is a close link between the maintenance of informal networks based on typical masculine values and the permanence of cartel practices. So this is important for a few reasons. First of all, this demonstrates that behavioral analysis of economic agents and their relationships uh, amongst them and with the institution they work for uh, may very well constitute the core of cartel analysis. Um, these aspects are key, uh, we believe, to determine how perpetrators balance the terms of incentives and deterrence, and going forward should no longer be included only as marginal explanations. Uh, secondly, this shows that the wealth of research and literature that is available for other white collar crimes uh, can be used as reference uh, to develop our understanding of the dynamics of illicit behavior. And finally, our research would bring to light the fact that the continued exclusion of women from a number of work opportunities and the increased sustainability of cartels share, indeed, 
common factors and circumstances. Um, so we try to demonstrate that continued gender imbalance constitutes an important risk factor for cartel practices and should be included um, as a relevant screening element for the enforcement policy of competition authority, but also as a major point of attention for compliant officials. Um, just one last point, we have uh, started to put together a list of possible concrete measures that can be taken uh, by competition authorities and by compliant offi compliance officials. Um, with regard to competition authorities, we recommend for the future to use gender denomination in public decisions every time this is possible without affecting anonymity. We also recommend to develop as much as possible um, in factual consideration these interpersonal relationships between individuals that we've seen are key. Um, and most importantly, we would recommend to develop screen based on gender imbalance in the structure of the company and not only at the board level, these for ex officio cases. Um, for compliance official, we also believe that um, they should consider gender imbalance as risk factor for internal audit activities. Uh, we should suggest to increase control over participation of employees in both formal and informal networks. And we also recommend expanding um, compliance training to include considerations related to gender issues and white collar crime. And I think I will stop here. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Alexi. If we could turn now to uh, Maria to start off the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Isolde. And thanks to Chris and the OECD for inviting me to participate in this workshop to contribute to an emerging field of study. I am Maria Manuela Palacio, and I am a lawyer in Colombian Competition Authority. And again, congratulations, Alexi and Carolina. Um, in the following five minutes, I will run. I would like to provide a general comment on the very ambitious plan of thinking competition policy through a gender lens. And then I will provide some targeted comments to Alexia and Carolina's very thought provoking research, which I've had the pleasure of discussing earlier. My comments are built on my lessons and insights uh, from my own experience. I would like to begin by saying that finding an answer to how to adopt a gender inclusive stance in general term terms may seem easy, but isn't. For starters, you should want to know the meaning of the word gender and to what exactly is it referring to and the potential implications of its use. The most probable result of carrying out that fundamental inquiry would be to end up confronted by a vast literature originated in a range of disciplines, showing how rich and utterly complex the gender studies field is. And this should not dissuade you from thinking broadly into some of the most challenging questions, problems and cutting edge debates and developments on the subject for thinking broadly is, and I believe uh, is a rigor rigorous and enriching task, and it is most likely to add perspective and contribute to the further utility of the research. I think it would sort of encourage a spillover effect. Um, it is, I think it is also important to know that this research will have academic and policy impact. Um, you might discover when you do that research that most of the up-to-date discussions are still related to issues you would assume to be from the past, problems that are associated to patterns of arbitrary differentiations or exclusions in certain professions, or debates concerning whether it can be generic, desirable or undesirable characteristics of individuals, or if some are more or less likely to behave in a certain way. This state of the art reveals not only that inequalities proliferate, but also that there's a still a need for clarification, for shifting paradigms when explaining gender differences, and because some of these inequalities have been acquired, this subtle feature of blending into everyday life seeming justified. Um, I, I am running. Take, for instance, that um, despite decades of progress, women remain underrepresented in a wide variety of sectors of the economy. That's a phenomenon often stated as referred to as glass ceiling. And these facts matter a lot to us as the underlying plan is to contribute to advancement of gender equality goals. Now, when researching, you will also encounter that these patterns of inequality are widespread. And although very similar, each pattern is deeply rooted in very multifaceted historical contexts, affected by cultural and social factors, and interlaced with racial, class, and ethnic identities, as has been said before. Uh, hence, the need of historical, social, and political awareness, in addition to a networked 
and inclusive comprehension of a universally relevant phenomenon. So my general comment would be that discovering and informing the projects with the complexity, richness, and ubiquity of gender studies is critical because it reminds us of the need to be aware of some hidden assumptions and to be cautious of not to perpetuate bias and stereotypes that, as we know, have long been fought. And it is important to consider how the category gender would be instrumental to entangling and better understanding the social phenomena we are most concerned of, which is in this case, cartel conspiracies and collusion, and to be sure not to reinforce the stereotype views when reporting the results. Whatever we understand as feminine and masculine, whatever we decide to embed into those categories and also to ignore, will definitely have an impact on the way we see the world and the way we produce the knowledge. How rigorous and consistent we are in that elemental task in formulating hypotheses and methodologies will certainly determine whether gender serves as a relevant variable and predictor in our work. And in another level, it may affect how we impart justice. And just to wrap up, here are my specific comments to the research. Firstly, and as I said earlier, this project is really interesting in many ways. I think I have said it to Carolina and Alexia and Sarah a lot, a lot of times. Um, and the reason is because it challenges assumptions of objectivity and rationality, not only from market agents' behavior, but also from the way that antitrust law has been applied based on such assumptions. And this challenge is key because it makes the hypothesis of the research is trying to test very relevant, which is the presence of voice clubs based on informal networks, that those voice clubs based on informal networks may enable unlawful coordination and cooperation among competitors and may explain cartel formation and stability. And it is very relevant because the results of the study may provide evidence of the usefulness and the conduciveness of including into competition assessment and cartel detection, the examination of social dynamics and interpersonal relations among agents within market system, and the way of corporate culture and institutional setting for, the, for taking decisions. Um, I don't know if I have time. I just have one last comment. A little bit more time, that's fine. Okay. Um, one of the assertions that is going to be tested with the research caught my attention particularly, and it did because it touches upon one key issue when discussing gender equality, which is bias that comes from possible gaps in data. And allow me quickly to read the assertion. It says that based on the theoretical framework, the researchers will demonstrate that the preservation of shared values, loyalty, and homosocial patterns within male informal professional networks is a key factor for maintenance of cartel practices beyond what purely rational calculation would dictate. And this assertion is really revealing that cartel conspiracies are perceived as mostly conducted by men. And it is thought provoking because it opens the room for discussing why is that men are perceived as such and whether these gendered patterns in cartel cases may be pointing out particular markets where women, for instance, have been affected by restrictions to advancing up the corporate ladder or to engaging in particular economic activity, perhaps while scoping for signs of market distortions and in the course of evaluating whether, whether certain characteristic behaviors of fraternity or of the so-called voice clubs dynamics um, are enable, enabling collusion, competition authorities may as well be uncovering exclusion of women in the economy, systems of male dominance or even empirical evidence of how um, men and women have experienced the economy differently. Or on the other hand, this could be revealing that the cartel institution might itself be masculine associated, leading to think of potential biases, even in detection. And these are all hypotheses resulting from the project that, and have many caveats as the, the authors have pointed out. And just to conclude very briefly, I would like to address the limitations that the authors pointed out in their intermediary paper and in their presentation. I see them as, opportunities to improve in the consistency of analysis and to the limitations in scope and in depth, I believe that it would be beneficial to testing the hypothesis to consider expanding the sample of cartel cases and include from multiple and diverse authorities because their case narrative, their case narratives and investigative powers and strategy are most likely to differ and help inform the debate, thereby providing the possibility of seeing the issue from different standpoints. And also, it would be very interesting to consider into the theoretical framework literature concerning the risk to competition of trade associations. This came to my mind thanks to Adam Smith, 
who has really long permeated the cartel literature by stating that people, and I, I make an emphasis in people, of the same seldom trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends up in conspiracy against the public or in some contributes to race practices. Considering the logic behind dynamics of trade associations, it could inform the debate as well. Thank you very much. That's Thank you. my comments. Thank you, Maria. Over now to our final discussant, Sarah Long. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much, um, Isodi, and Chris as well, and to the whole team. And just a, a massive congratulations to everybody for the time and effort that's gone into this workshop. It's truly fantastic. And for those of us that have been quite interested in this area for a couple of years now, I think the, the first thing I wanted to say is what has clearly been lacking is data and and what is absolutely imperative is that we have the data to support or indeed challenge some of the views that those of us who've been thinking about this have had because without data we are nowhere so that that's the sort of the, the real excitement for me is to be able to see so much progress and i know that we've reiterated that it is a work in progress but a work in progress is a good place to start I also just wanted to obviously say thank you to Alexi and Carolina for their excellent presentation and also for being so open with their research ideas. We've had the benefit, Maria and I have had the benefit of a couple of calls actually in advance of this session, just to talk through some of their um, initial work. And we've been really impressed with not just the work they've done, but how willing they are to consider our ideas and think about um, the structure of the research as it goes forward. So there were two points I wanted to make. One is about sort of this, this link with the informal networks and whether competition authorities should be doing more about that in terms of how they gather um, information and thinking about whether that could link into the research. And then also uh, kind of with my corporate hat on, I suppose, because um, I am a, a partner at a, a law firm that obviously advises lots of corporate companies and trying to think about how maybe this could be incorporated, this, got, this um, evidence could kind of incorporated in the ways in which compliance programs work sort of going forward. So the first point is you know, thinking about whether we need competition authorities to have a better understanding of the relationships between cartelists. So this, this concept of the informal network. And it's quite interesting. And I noticed in one of the questions in the chat that someone had said that cartel members may be part of the same football team or, and we had someone else saying they may be part of the same school, but that data is not collected by competition authorities. Now, the question is, do competition authorities need to start looking at that? And I suppose the way in which you would link it to the scope of a competition authority's role is to really understand what is the relationship between the parties. And for any of us that have carried out interviews with companies or individuals involved in um, cartel arrangements, you know, it's always about people. And this is the thing that I think we've also learned that really we, we, we're not talking about a situation where you have a, a sort of dispassionate economic um, uh, incentive. You're actually talking about often personal interrelationships. And so it's about thinking, I wonder whether we could sort of consider within the research what more could be done by competition authorities? So we've talked already about getting more data from competition authorities around existing um, cases that have happened, but it might be also about pushing the understanding around the narrative of how the cartel came about. And that is underpinned, based on the research that has been sort of carried out so far, on relationships between um, people. So that I think would be quite an interesting point to consider. The second point I wanted to pick up on is sort of around these institutional norms embodied by the firm. So thinking about the, 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 body, the, the firm or company as a kind of moral entity and this fantastic concept of women as mavericks. Now I'm not going to lie, when we talked about this before I said whatever happens women as mavericks has to appear in the title of your research somewhere. But um, actually What's quite interesting is initially my thought was great, okay, we need more women non-executive directors to come in as that maverick in a board context. But then having sort of reflected and with the benefit of discussions with um, Alexi and Carolina, I realized that certainly, probably I was looking at it the wrong way around. 
because it's not actually about the gender of the individual holding that role. It's about the ability for someone external to an internal network to come in and challenge the institutional norms within that firm. And in doing so, consider pockets of gender imbalance that could exacerbate competition compliance or cartel risks. So one of the roles of an NED is to be morally incorruptible, effectively. And lots of other roles, they've got lots of other things to do, but th there's a real significant focus in, on sort of ESG initiatives now, which is environmental, social and governance issues, as boards increasingly recognise the need not just to carry out a sort of box ticking exercise or pay lip service to these sorts of issues, but actually take some really proactive action. So what I was thinking is it would be really valuable to try and link this sort of potentially groundbreaking research with current ESG measures in the corporate governance world. So for example, I know in the UK, the government is going to be, I think, issuing a white paper that will include some legislative proposals for corporate governance reform. So my thoughts and you know, was whether this is something that the research or the work in progress could perhaps consider or incorporate going forward. Now there's, there's so much more I can say, but I know that that's sort of my time. So rather than, um, Keeping going, I will pass back to um, Carolina Alexi. Carolina Alexi, would you like to respond? So, if if I, if, if I may uh, respond quickly to to uh, Maria's comments, yes, um, we do have to get serious about gender studies, and uh, we we will. That's that's thanks for 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 this and for all, all that you mentioned in our previous conversation. It's already being taken into account and and we 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 realized uh on this work that any definition you might try to use or any any words you you use as well uh is, is um never unequivocal and there are feedback loops everywhere between the body and the mind the the collective and the individual and so it, this has to be reflected we use gender because it is a, a, a word that at this moment reflects the situation of the person employed in the company and the way his or her sex biological situation is considered in, in the firm. But it's, it's not an easy definition. And since, again, there are feedback loops everywhere, we'll have to think what we mean by, in particular, by masculine values, because we are trying actually to extract Note what we call masculine values from the individuals that happen to be men. And, and what we mean by masculine values, what we mean by all of those locker rooms, uh, discussions, loyalty, etc., will have to be defined more clearly, and we certainly intend to do it. Carolina, anything to add? Just to add on what Sarah was saying. Um, about the pockets of gender imbalance. I think what we're really trying to do is to bring this cross-disciplinary approach to antitrust so that we can understand what to do with those pockets of gender imbalance. Uh, because as we were um, talking about in other occasions, the real issue is, first of all, to give a name to the problem. Because as a, as a first take, pockets of gender imbalance and antitrust don't really seem like things that can go together. But then when we get to really explore the dynamics and the link on how these two elements go together and that solving one might help the other and how this is done uh, through a cross-disciplinary approach, I think that in this sense that we can get to have a proper practical recommendation for competition authorities, that it's something that we, I guess it's a shared goal, because only at that point there would be something that would be able to be seen in practice. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add the, this part. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes of further discussion. And one of the things I was hoping to do was to touch base with the presenters and the discussants before we move to any additional questions that people might have from the floor. And just to say in a number of one of the themes I saw today in the discussion was that there was feedback about the um, quality of the data that was available, how to improve that and the ways to make that more broad and representative in each of the projects. And that the presenters were also aware of some of those issues and also looking at how um, to 
to do that. I'd be interested in any thoughts that the presenters or discussants have about similarities or differences um, between the projects and how they might inform each other. And an additional um, question to the presenters if, if they think they can answer it about the kind of time frame that they think um, their research will actually have an impact on either competition policy or competition enforcement because there's a sense of this being really important but also early days but are we talking a kind of a five-year time frame a 10-year time frame how 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 when will that make change and is there a way to um, put more um, energy or resources in it to shorten that time frame are there any of the presenters or discussants who'd like to, to kick us off with a kind of a overall discussion? Alexi? Um, one, one, one thing that we would, with Carolina, that we would recommend, we also had a discussion with Maria who, who was planning to ask what, what was done, done by the Colombian um, authority is that in, in the best decisions I have seen from the French Competition Authority and in the Colombian decisions, there is a section on the interpersonal relationship between the participants of the cartel at the beginning of the description of the facts. This is a very, very useful tool. And the other thing that is very important, which you already mentioned, is to, to have the gender of people. So in, in my opinion, it would not take very long for competition authority just to do that, just to keep a compilation. If you, if you take, if you bother to write that in your decision in the first place, take that into a table, it's not going to take you very, very long. So that, that's my two cents. Thank you, Alexi. Any of the other speakers or discussants? Uh, let me may briefly um, uh, agree with uh, Alexis. And I think um, the OECD can uh, obviously play a good role here in sort of advocating this type of uh, data collection with competition agencies around the world. Um, so I think this would be tremendous. And uh, what we have seen in the past from different fields of research, once the data is there, people jump on it. Uh, basically. So um, uh, I think this could be a great stimulus, uh, actually, for this type of research. Thank you, Carolina. I see your hand up. Yeah, and um, just to follow on what Alexi was saying, once that compilation part is uh, uh, taken care of, I think it would not be um, so burdensome to start thinking about a system of red flags. We already have cartel screens that are widely used and are constantly developed and improved uh, and adding elements that are linked to these natural dynamics and uh, gender imbalance to help out uh, through screens. I think it's something that in practice is doable. Uh, of course, we need the data force, but once we have that, uh, if there is the motivation and the interest of competition agencies to do so, I think it's uh, doable. Thank you. If there are no further comments from the speakers or discussants on oh, that point. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to add just from the kind oh, of the corporate angle there, because I think something that we discussed a number of times was trying to also leverage this onto the agenda of corporates and companies so that it becomes a real world issue. And the way in which to do that is obviously if competition authorities are red flagging, flagging certain behavior and um, investigating companies because they have certain concerns that that's going to move companies in their compliance programs but I think we're in terms of your point on timing we're a long way from that uh, and what I'm really interested in doing is doing this in a in a parallel way so we're, we're going through the research now but rather than waiting five years until we have something which is absolutely bona fide um, verifiable data. Let's get corporates involved now so that they understand what the, the research is about, what the evidence is pointing towards. They can start shifting their policies internally now so that we have a comprehensive and cohesive way of doing things that works both in terms of the competition authority level, but also at the corporate level. Thank you. 
Um, no, I thoroughly agree with that. Are there any other comments from the presenters or discussants? Otherwise, I'm just, or if you just uh, one of the uh, audience, if you'd like, if you have a question you'd like to present, please raise your hand. Uh, I will just, uh, if I may. <laughs> yes, sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just departing from Sarah's comment. Uh, totally agree with, with what has been said because if we think that regulators have the power to request information in a certain procedure or investigation and that information sometimes concerns the board's composition, we have there uh, a tool that might be used in order to achieve information regarding gender balance in board composition. And it will be also important and it will also function as a signal for companies to understand that this is a concern and not only, uh, like Sarah said, the tick box exercise. Thank you. Um, Matilda. Thank you. Just uh, to more a comment than a question. Uh, I was fascinated by the discussion and what I will take uh, from it outside of the purely like competition angle that I really appreciate, but uh, for my role, more like supervising everything related to business conduct at the OECD, I, I, I was really struck by all the linkages with the discussion on corporate governance, the discussion on ESG, and you mentioned that, Sarah, uh, uh, I think it's quite clear. And, and I would be more optimistic than you because these discussions are, are advancing greatly these days. And the discussion on women on boards uh, per se, the discussion on sustainable corporate governance uh, more generally, and the discussion on ESGs are happening now. So I do think that the, there is more hope in this sense that these could come, come here to also advancement more on the competition angle per se. Uh, and in terms of data, of course, I take also the call for, for having uh, more data. And, uh, and also what uh, you just mentioned, like let's get uh, corporates involved in this discussion. I do think it's an excellent idea, not only to, to accelerate the impact of uh, any discussion we might have at the policy level, but, uh, but also to inform us and, and, and also accelerate uh, access to data. So, so for me, it, it was a, a absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, it, uh, it will help us uh, not only on the, the, the work we do on competition, but the work we do in business conduct more generally. Also, all the links with the, the same type of discussion we could have on compliance more generally, you know, in the anti-bribery uh, sphere, for example, so, uh, and the, or in the responsible business conduct uh, area, uh, uh, sphere. So, so this is uh, super interesting, and I do think that uh, we, we need to have a more uh, horizontal approach to these issues of uh, gender and compliance in general. So thank you very much for, for all the, the speakers. Yes, um, I don't see any other hands raised, so I think we'll call it to a close. But I too wanted to say thank you very much to all of the speakers and discussants. Um, I'd had the privilege of being able to see the presentations beforehand, but hearing people actually flesh it all out, talk about how they're going to do it, and also the degree to which the discussants had engaged with the material, and I think really pushed the presenters of the projects and made that the conversation we were looking for was really fabulous. And I think what I can also see is that this is a discussion from, from the chat questions we've had and here too that we need to continue to have, that this is something that is going to be really best informed by a, a collaborative process. And so then again, I touched on what Chris had said about shifting this conversation also over to the LinkedIn space um, so that those who are involved in the projects this from this session also the ones this afternoon can hear people's comments discussions that we can talk about solutions for imperfect data what we can do within our time frame and also this collaboration between what the competition agencies can do and what the private sector can do mm -hmm. and how to kind of speed up this time frame so once again thank you for everyone who's been involved the presenters the discussants those who've contributed to the chats and also all of the people at the the back end of the organization for the session this morning we'll be returning in an hour you're very welcome to stay connected when the next session connects at 3 30 sorry at three o'clock no four o'clock there will be a bit of technical stuff beforehand so you might want to be on mute before that but otherwise you're welcome to to stay on board and we look forward to seeing you in an hour after a coffee break thank you again